Now you might ask, why do people substitute toward higher quality goods as income rises? <coughs> as opposed to just buy more of the same stuff. Why? Yeah. What do you mean by need? But, why, but is it really the limitations of my wants that's driving it? Or is it more like some constraint? Like, you know, you know, and, and this is a fall this is, I think, a fallacy of the way we set up the problems. My fault. Okay, I'll take the point. I wrote down this utility function as if that was kind of the primitive. And that creates the illusion that somehow demand. And the theory of demand is embedded in people's psychology and inside their mind. Actually, most of what we know about demand theory is outside the person. It's really in the production process by which we produce what we ultimately want. And I think what's behind the vacation example is really the unlimited amount of time that one has. One can't, if you had an infinite amount of time, you'd say, shit, I'll just take 17 vacations to Hawaii. It's really, no, I gotta, so I gotta do higher quality vacations. I really like eating all these hamburgers, but man, maybe, you know, eat, I might got a limited stomach capacity. I can't eat 12 fat guys' hamburgers. So I gotta find like some other hamburger that I like even better than fat guys. Okay, or five guys, I guess, not fat. <laughs> so, so, you know, so I, I got to find that because you know, if I had an unlimited stomach capacity, maybe I would just eat more and more five guys. There also might be problems with my health if I did all that, but that's another, that's another form of this. In other words, you know, you don't want to think about consumption and utility as this black box that somehow we can't get a window in. Much of what we know about consumer theory and demand theory is precisely because we know about these elements of what you might call household production. We know people want entertainment. And people want to travel. And people want food. And people want, you know, all these different basic things. But there are constraints in terms of on the consumption side. And to the extent you can get those constraints out of things you can't see and into things you can see and measure, the more powerful your theory is going to be. Because the biggest problem we're going to have with this utility, at least the way I wrote it, is we got no theory. It's just a black box. We might have some restrictions I can put on you, but they're damn weak. What's really going to help me is if I can actually put some content in there. I can think about things being complements and substitutes because of things I can measure, things I can see. And that's going to turn out to be a big part of utility theory. And we've kind of subsumed all that here. We just wrote down these preferences as if that was the starting point. It's really not. Preferences that we see are really the product of some more fundamental underlying desires that people have combined with the technologies they have for create, fulfilling those desires and using the goods that they purchase in the market to fill those desires. And that's you know, a whole field of things called household production that Gary Becker was fundamental in developing, kind of tried to get at those ideas, that the goods we actually care about are actually produced goods that we produce using the things that we buy in the marketplace. And you might say, well, geez, that's just adding an extra layer of complication. I think that's exactly wrong. It's actually adding a layer of observability. You know, like we talked about complements and substitutes. A good example of complements are like cars and gasoline. Everybody agrees cars and gasoline are complements. What does that have to do with utility? Does the complementarity flow out of psychology? 
the psychology tell me why cars and gasoline ought to be compliments? But somehow when people have more cars, they just like to have more gasoline? No, if I was from Mars, I could tell you cars and gasoline are going to be compliments. Why? Yeah, because of the way they want transportation and they get used together. Right? It has nothing to do with preferences in the classical sense. Right? You wouldn't, it's not a theory, I don't need a theory of preferences to tell me why cars and gasoline are kind of okay. People see that? All right. Why don't we, so that's, you know, so we can talk about income elasticities. We talk about normal versus inferior. So in general, the rule is going to be broad categories of goods are normal. Narrow, narrowly defined goods will often have some kind of life cycle. Where they're normal at some income ranges, even if they're inferior at higher income ranges. You can come up with weird examples where they kind of go down and go back up again, but we, we, won't, we won't bother ourselves with those examples. Okay. All right.